We all know about the joy experienced making photographs. It's a feeling that makes the process so intoxicating. It's a feeling that comes from recognizing the potential of a moment or depressing the shutter at just the right second or holding that finished print. It just feels so good. For some of us, there's another joy that arises from photography. It's the feeling associated with entering other people's lives, and not just for the sake of a photograph. It's licensed to learn and share in someone else's life in a way that just doesn't happen in the common world. It's a wonderful gift to be trusted in that special way. Amy Tunzing's work reflects that joy. Her career as a photojournalist and documentary photographer has gained her entry to the world of Australian Aborigines, to beachcombers of the Jersey Shore. Her work for National Geographic reflects her skills as a photographer and as a human being with both patience and a compassionate heart. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. So how are you? So you, how are you guys uh, holding up in the midst of all this madness? I, you know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, I feel very lucky, but that doesn't mean that on a daily basis, I'm not like pulling my hair out. <laughs> so <laughs> I try to remember how lucky I am, but definitely it's been a little crazy. I don't know if you feel this. I was thinking about this recently. Like it just, it's weird that it's gotten kind of normalized on so many levels but with what's going on it's like we've just adjusted you know how you yeah. proceed and I, I think it also involves a, a certain degree of denial <laughs> right yeah <laughs> you know. yeah yeah there's a lot of denial. yeah because i think it caught up to me emotionally about two or three weeks ago i'm constantly busy with things so right and then one day it's like i couldn't be busy enough mm. and i just felt it just incredibly fatigued mm. and there was nothing happening in terms of my health or my life to sort of explain it. But I think it just like, it was just so much constant noise Yeah, that I felt like I couldn't escape that it was just like, Oh my God, I just need to, you know, decompress. And I think I spent a couple of days like disconnected, reading yeah. a book, taking long naps, you know, and it was just like, I didn't realize how much I needed it until I needed it. Mm. It's just so insane what's happening. It's just, it's so crazy. The, 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 the politics right now are just, it's so upside down. And then at the same time, there's this undercurrent of like trying to just live logic, like just the logistics of it, you know, with, yeah. with life stuff. And then you're like, and then you, the noise and, and what's happening too is just so the upheaval is insanity. So I'm with you, <laughs> but I haven't had that moment of, I mean, we finally, we went camping on our land a couple of weekends ago. Like we, we bought land up near the Adirondacks. We, my husband and myself and my, our three-year-old, we all moved to Syracuse, New York a mm -hmm. year ago for this new job that I got as a tenure track professor at Syracuse University. So that's like a massive change, but with living in Syracuse, it was like, okay, we're going to get at least get land in the Adirondacks if we're going to move to upstate. <laughs> we're going to have some sort of okay. benefits to have around this. But the going out and camping was, I guess that resonates with what you're talking about, like just kind of shutting it down a little bit was, was very helpful. The quiet yeah. was, for sure. Well, I, I find these conversations give me at least an hour of respite. <laughs> Good. So I, get yeah. to talk, I get to talk shop with interesting people and, you know, I, I'm, I usually am left with, uh, well, not usually, almost every time, uh, left with just a, a feeling of positivity, positivity and hope. Mm -hmm. So, so I hope that that's what listeners sort of take away from it when they, when they listen to the show. 
Oh, yeah. And, and, and I think um, just like a segue from the evening with the masters, I think that that was, I'm, I'm making my way through the talks right now video, because again, we have a three year old. So I just I didn't make it to a lot of them over the summer mm-hmm. because of the timing of it for the East Coast, it was bedtime, every time it was happening. So it didn't go over very well with the timing. But now it's been amazing to listen to it. So oh, yeah. And it gave me an excuse to find out more about you because I knew of your work, but that was the first time I'd ever really had a chance, a good chance to sort of take it in. Yeah. And I really enjoyed your presentation. I thought it was wonderful, but I look even more look forward to having an hour with you today. So thank you again for for doing this. Cool. Thank you. In in doing my research, I saw a presentation that you did in which you um, and several other photographers were working with uh, like Somali photographers, African photographers, as part of a a project with, um, I think it was National Geographic or uh, at least National Geographic distributed the video for it. Was it, um, was it PhotoCamp? National Geographic Yeah, it was PhotoCamp. Right. I mean, I've done a lot of photo camps. So was it in Kenya or was it in the United States with some? Because well, we never went to Somalia. There was one photographer called Chol Mal, uh, Mayak. Yeah. Amazing photographer. And you were you were sitting down there with Catherine Simone Arona. I yes. Think. Oh, that's what. We, OK, I know what you're talking about now. We did. Uh, so it was really cool. They came to D.C. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And they were, they were South Sudanese. Okay. Yeah. And I really loved watching that. And one of the things that I wanted to start the conversation was based on something that Chol said when he was talking about his work. And this is a fellow who uh, had been living in a refugee camp who had no really formal education when he came into ph- photography and basically was sort of trained on how to use a camera and to sort of tell a story. And one of the most insightful things he said was this idea when he was asked about approaching people in the refugee camps to make photographs. He talked about, you know, he first came to them as a human being, secondly, as a photographer. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I was just, it (laughs) was, it was, was, like, who is this guy? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) totally. Oh God, those photo camps, it's always like that. They're uh, just amazing. Yeah. But it's like, that's, that's a lesson. I think most people from, our part of the world mm-hmm. have a hard time learning mm-hmm. if it's not just sort of innate, yeah. but just the fact that it came from someone who just understood it. And I wanted to, to sort of start our conversation from there. You know, the idea that as amazing as the images that you create are and the stories you get to tell, that the underlying strength of anything that, that we do as photographers lies in that inherent sense of empathy Mm -hmm. and i i think it's not discussed often enough Mm because we see the work we see the end result and you'll get questions like what camera did you use what lens did you use and it's like um wait a second there's something really poignant that is being shared here Mm -hmm. that i think it's easy for us both as photographers and viewers to miss Mm -hmm. and i'm wondering in this time that you've had with not only this group of, of photographers, but others that you've taught, what they have taught you about empathy and compassion? You know, the, um, the teaching is something that's always, it, it's like kind of eked its way into my existence as a photographer. And it started really with National Geographic photo camps. And that's where we go as a it started actually as a as a whole separate thing outside of National Geographic it was started by a woman Kirsten Elsner who's also a photographer we met in the 1990s she was, we were working at the New York Times and she we always would we were young we were in our 20s she would always we'd share our dreams and she would say someday I'm gonna do this program we're putting cameras in the hands of kids from communities where they don't normally get to talk about their lives and their stories. And, and we stayed in touch and eventually she did start a program like that in Annapolis. And then she connected it with geographic. And since like 2003, a couple times a year, teams of photographers and editors go into these a whole multitude of different communities, but generally it's communities that wouldn't normally have access to cameras or, or Mm -hmm. teaching or workshops. And, and it's taken on different iterations, but right now it's a very active program, except for COVID has slowed it down. That was my entree into 
teaching, which I feel really lucky about uh, because it was into these communities where there was so much discovery just with the with the ability to for these young folks and some sometimes it's people in their 20s, but a lot of times it was like teenagers and, and that age to t- to tell their story, really. And I think, you know, back to your question is what I what I learned the most is to me, it was the going in there. I think teaching is very to me, it's the same as if I'm going to go in and work on a story somewhere or decide to take on a story somewhere. It's the same sort of thing. You, we, you, you teach through connection, you know, like or for me, that's, that, that's, that's what happens. That's the most exciting thing about teaching. I'm, I'm guessing that's pretty universal that it is, it's about connecting and sharing, right? Like mm-hmm. that's ultimately what it's about. And I, I think in the same light, it's the same, for doing any sort of photographic endeavor it's about connection it's about connection at least that's what it that's really what it is a lot for me i do like the craft of photography but that's definitely the less exciting part for me um it's definitely about that relationship that happens so i would say what what i've learned most from students would go sit hand in hand with what's happened with people that I end up and communities that I end up photographing is I learn everything. Like they've, they've all, they've all, they're all part of my DNA. <laughs> it's who I am. You know, it's like our friends are, are um, those relationships that we build. So, and I would have to say through um, a lot of these communities with photo camps, it's, you know, they're, they, these are students that don't have access to this sort of, classroom or right. these cameras or this sort of thing. So for them to suddenly have the ability and the tool to talk about their lives or the lives of their family or their, their community, it just reminds me over and over again about what a powerful tool photography is. I, yeah. I know that's kind of a cliche, but it really is. It's really powerful. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Cause whenever I see work by, by people like these young uh, Sudanese photographers. One of the things I'm always reminded of is that the way they see their own lives is very different from how we see them. Mm. Even if we go there as informed, educated photographers. And I was hearing them speak and looking at the photographs. And one of the things that stood out for me was that despite their circumstances, there's always a certain degree of hope that comes from, from the, you know, their, their circumstances can be incredibly dire. They, you know, they've lost family members. Health is not good. Access to resources can be incredibly limited. And yet they're able to see their lives and see through the camera in a way that most Western eyes, it wouldn't be as obvious to. And mm. And the way that I thought about it is that we often see such people in in circumstances based on how we assume we would react if we lost everything that we had, right? And so the focus Mm -hmm. is on imagining through these images what what that loss is and thinking that that is at the heart of the the story. Mm -hmm. But one of the interesting things I've heard um, as a result of all the stuff that's happening with COVID and people losing their jobs, and I think it's been attributed to a couple of different people, but they basically say, especially if they've been poor or, you know, it's like, we've been poor before. We've lost everything before. So if we do it again, if we happen to do it again, we've been there. So it doesn't terrify us to the degree that it may for someone who's never had that circumstance. And that's what I kind of took away from hearing these, these photographers talk about their work is like their life experiences have allowed them to see the, their lives in a way that many of us it wouldn't be obvious to and as a photographer especially photographers like us who come from privilege i think that's one of the hurdles that we have to sort of surmount is understanding that we have that sort of inherent bias as well as, as mm-hmm. intended as we may be that it's mm-hmm. there and i'm wondering with you in terms of what you've done over this you know your career at different phases in terms of being able to 
navigate around that to make sure that you're telling as honest a, a story as you can. You know, and I, and and who knows uh, what an honest story is, right? Like, mm-hmm. what what does that mean, really? What does an honest story mean? Is it is it you know, because because I there there's no we we are coming into these situations all of us as who we are. So I am a privileged white female uh, going into. And and that and those those three characteristics, you know, privileged white female, those those stand out really strong when you go to certain specific places. But then I did a story last year in Montana, and I spent a lot of time with ranchers. And there, I'm a East Coast liberal. <laughs> <laughs> so so I think that what how we come into each situation changes you know that like race is part of everything as we know like you can't talk about Mm -hmm. anything in the united states without considering race i mean a lot of people don't feel that way but that is the reality historically but in that situation their race is still there but they're not thinking that's it's not part of their makeup about it but yeah in the grander scheme of things, it's a huge story about race because they're on Native American land. And, you know, so like you can tease that out, I think, of any story. So I guess the way that I think about it is one tries best you can to be really aware of who you are mm-hmm. on many multiple, like many dimensions. You know, I don't know how good I am at that, but it's definitely something I'm open to. I, I I definitely think that's an important thing to acknowledge. You know, if you're working in Uganda in a really poor area, which most of it is, you have to realize like on some, some tiny level, at least as best you can, what power you're bringing into that situation. Um, Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you can keep things objective or, avoid it but i think there's there's something to be said for being aware of it i guess yeah. and i and i think being female too i think there's a the projections a lot more gets projected on uh, a female on some levels and and i and i think that that happens to any identity for different reasons like we we mm-hmm. all project things onto to all sorts of different people but I find I have to be aware of those those projections too. Like what's being projected on me as I'm trying to navigate this story where it does kind of come down to issues around conservatism and, and liberalism in the United States, um, speaking back again to the story that I did in Montana, because right now you can't do any stories in America without it boiling down. Like everything's mm-hmm. political. I'm I'm sorry I'm answering your story in such a long way but I guess That's I guess okay. it's one <laughs> it's one trying to try your best to be really aware of what you are bringing to the situation and then secondly then after that my job is to tune in ex- as extremely personally to the individuals whom I'm portraying you know it's almost like be aware of all the big stuff Mm-hmm. Be aware of, of race and politics and gender and all of that stuff. But then and then when it boils down to the images, that's about that specific personal relationship and truly trying to be there to absorb their story and yeah. and take it in. And then also still then again, being aware of all the big stuff. <laughs> so it's like um, it's a constant conversation, I guess. But it's very personal, too. I was revisiting uh, Mary Ellen Mark's Streetwise, uh, the film that she did with her husband, Martin Bell. And she Mm, talks about in that Streetwise. Yeah, she did it with Martin Bell in the uh, 80s, a bunch of uh, runaway street kids in Seattle. And one of the uh, one of the uh, people that she followed was a teenage girl named Tiny. Her nickname was Tiny. And she says while she was doing this, this story, she realized that Tiny was one of the characters who through whom she wanted to help tell the story right so she gave, may have come in with a sort of general assignment in terms of you know street kids in in an urban city but she 
discovered a way of being able to tell that story by following not just Tiny, but a couple of other of the of the kids that are on the street. And so my question to you is when you go into an assignment where you have a theme or an idea or a concept or a, an issue, you can go in there, but you don't necessarily know exactly who you're going to focus on. And so I'm just curious in terms of finding a, a basically a conduit. Mm -hmm. uh, basically a way that I as the viewer or the reader can connect with the story through the experience of, a, of an individual or, or a small group of people. I was actually just thinking about that this morning because um, so I, I was just talking about my evolution as a teacher and it really started out as like, you know, as a freelance photographer, you're mostly just trying to survive. So most of the year is taken up mm -hmm. trying to trying to pay the bills and photo camp was that constant thing for about 20 years but now as a as a professor and working through these like really longer term stories with students it's just really interesting to kind of slow down and try to tease out the process right and so that's a and I was trying to think through how to describe it and it's interesting that you're saying you know how do you find that person that's going to be a conduit for that story and in my head I was thinking like it, it is really interesting because you're you know you you have to do the research and learn the the truths about the story so so for mm -hmm. example I did a really long-term project on widowhood and I started out as a personal project I was mostly looking at it in India and then when it became a geographic story we expanded it to be more global and, and wanted to find a place and a angle in somewhere in Africa, which is a, which is a huge generalized order to go on. Like, okay, Africa, like that's, that, there's a lot of different yeah. cultures there. But, but what we did find is that there, there is a trend uh, that can actually be applied pretty globally, but it's, it's more about inheritance and, and this is a theme I think that that you can find for women all over the globe and it, and it happens to be very strong in many African countries. So there's a custom traditionally the men inherit the land there. That's just how it goes. So there's a thing that is has been coined called property grabbing. And so what happens is is, a woman's husband dies and then his family says like, nope, that land is part of our families. Uh, and especially as land in many African countries is becoming scarcer and scarcer and scarcer, the, the mm -hmm. sort of fight over it and the demand for it, the resources are becoming smaller. So a widow is going to get pushed out, you know, no problem at the end of poor people, women without men with this property grabbing, um, thing the the man would die and literally many times at the man's funeral his family would come back and claim the land and sometimes her children and this was hap this is happening in a pretty high percentage of of the countries that are in in Africa there's like it's it's in West Africa it's in East Africa it's 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 all over so this was something across the board. There's other things happening with widows in many African countries, but there there was very sensationalized things. But this was like the the theme that was going on predominantly in, in many areas. And then after that, it's like, okay, so that's an important economic story right now. So where can we find some contrast? Like where can we find something interesting going on with this issue? Mm -hmm. And then we found in Uganda, they actually have laws that specifically protect women with their inheritance, that they're entitled to inherit land after their husband dies and the belongings and the house and the money. But it wasn't being carried out. So the, there were really good laws. They have a really progressive constitution that's pretty equal gender wise, but it wasn't getting carried out. Then we found a organization who was working in a little sort of test county outside of Kampala where they were decided property grabbing is a huge issue for women. We're going to go in and we're going to educate the whole legal pipeline about what the laws are and what the rights are to these women. And we're going to start taking on their cases and fighting their cases, bringing, bringing justice for these mm -hmm. women. 
And so, I mean, this was a very fortunate situation, but it, it, it's, it's kind of bringing you like in the mindset, this is how it, it kind of telescopes in like, first there's this big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you find the location? What are the nuances? And then let's find something kind of interesting contrast to like talk about it, but not just sit there looking at women that have lost their land. Like let's find a situation where it's actually something cool is happening with it. Mm -hmm. So that was what got me to this little district, Makono district outside of Kampala. And then it was, um, I think I spent, and this is the, uh, you know, the advantage, the in extreme privilege of working for an organization like National Geographic is I'm actually able to take two weeks and work with a, a translator and go visit, you know, 15 different widows and interview them about their stories and then decide, okay, I really clicked with this woman. She's right mm -hmm. in the thick of it right now. She's this, she's that, you know, like there, there's all these levels. It's like, what is her story? Is she comfortable with me? Does she want me to be around? Yeah. You know, there's all of those things. So then, so then that's like the, the last layer to it. What is, what are the logistics of it? Is she going to, is she going to be around during that time? You know, there's actually very practical questions with narrowing down. So again, that's a very long answer to your question, but that's like, it kind of shows how it kind of goes. Oh, yeah. I, I, like, down to the, yeah. I like long answers. <laughs> but, and, and you know, the thing is, I'm really glad you asked about it because I think that's like some of the most enjoyable part of working on stories like that is yeah. that problem solving. Like how do I, okay, what's the, what is the, what is the essence of this story? What's the most important part of the story that takes such interesting research to get to that, like getting your head around it. And then it's like, and then how do I actually translate this to something happening on the ground? And then how do I make my camera see it, yeah. you know, in some sort of interesting hopefully enlightening way. Thanks to the many of you who have heard the call and have chosen to support the candid frame over the past year. It's been a difficult time for all of us in, in one way or another. So I greatly appreciate those of you who've made the choice to contribute to the show. It relieves some of the financial pressure of producing this show and having to juggle my 9 to 5, the podcast, and other freelance gigs. It helps make life just a little simpler and helps me to produce the best show that I can. If you want to help us in the work that we do here, it's really easy to do. You can do that by contributing $5, $10, $20, or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the Candid Frame. Even $5 a month makes a difference. So if you've been putting it off, why not make it happen today? Thank you so much for your kindness and support. Whether you're on, a, on assignment or working on a personal project, you just mentioned um, this organization in uh, Uganda that was working with these women. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm curious to know how important or and what role do gaining access to an organization that is dealing with whatever circumstance that you're documenting play in you being able to, one, get educated as well as gaining access? Everything. Everything. I mean, and, and the... Um the local journalist who I worked with on that story, Halima, who is an amazing woman, she's like, it's a, it is a, it takes a village, <laughs> you know, and it's like, and it's building those relationships. So Halima was, you know, my fixer, for lack of a better word, but she, she teamed up with me on this story and, and then I had already found international justice mission through research, but they they got on board and so oh yeah it's it's everything i mean i could i went out with halima and i went out and found additional widows because there was a degree of like i don't want to just be guided by international justice mission you know they they're mm -hmm. a nonprofit that has this really distinct 
mission, which is wonderful, but I also, I just, I wanted to get my bearings also in, in the region. So we did some just solo, not solo, but independent trips because there is danger to like just getting driven around by some organization and then that's all mm-hmm. you see. So just due diligence, I, right. we, we just wanted to go out and investigate on our own and find some other more local organizations that were helping widows. And so we moved around and kind of got our bearings, but definitely it's a, it's a huge part of it those and it's the relationships it's those relationships with them and 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 it's a collaboration you know just as much as it is with your with the subjects that you're working with to tell the story like you they need to participate like it's it's a big project that I see like enlisting all these like, I love that part of it, too, where I'm like, I got Halima on my side, and I know Betty's willing to let us do the story on her, and it's like, we're all working together to try to tell this story, mm-hmm. and that's kind of how I think of it, you know, like, even with the questions, and it's like, well, I really want to talk about this aspect of what you're struggling with, like, what's the best way to do that, and so you're you're kind of, like, it's a purpose... purpose <laughs> <laughs> it's a participatory thing, I guess, yeah. is how you can say it, yeah. It seems that we look at some of the the photographs that I've seen you take are really beautiful photographs and they're not sort of on the nose photographs in terms of speaking to the circumstances that you're addressing. It seems like a moment that's revealing more revealing of character Mm -hmm. than it is about the issue. Right. Mm -hmm. So as an individual image, it doesn't, it doesn't spell out the whole thing, but it's, it fleshes it out. It makes it a much fuller, um, it reveals the humanity of the people to a certain degree. And, mm-hmm. but I'm just trying to, you know, I would love to hear for you to sort of speak about the role that such images play, you know, like for example, uh, like land management, like with the Aborigine that you were d- you're doing, you know, mm-hmm. the, the relationship to, to the land, mm-hmm. there are images there in which you show the landscape and there's the figure in context with that. It's more like an environmental portrait. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so an image like that, I, it's like, OK, I, I get the connection. And then there's another image where you have just a girl playing. She's just running through the running through the scene. It's still the, the environment, but it's out of context. It would just look like, oh, this is a really nice image of a girl at play. Right. Right. But within the collection of the essay, it works. Some- right. Or does it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, and you really don't know until you see, you know, you, you get down to edit, but you can't, you can't be photographing everything that you're seeing. Right. No. I mean, I think that, well, one thing I think that you're seeing with my work, I believe is just, that's my obsession is what's the humanity in this. And that's just, you know, if, if anything geographic was such a challenging shift not shift because I, it was very early in my career, but I think, I think my, my, what brought me to photography was the humanity and kind of the excuse to hang out with people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, and then with, and it, it wasn't the technical, it wasn't the, you know, the, any of that. It was really like time to, to learn and to kind of have these moments of connection, which, help me understand my world a little bit more so with that with that like with working with geographic I had to keep I had to really force myself to step back and be like I have to show this landscape and I have to show this place and that's mm-hmm. really part of the mission when you're doing a geographic story so that was a real push for me is to kind of step back and not be so like what's up with this person yeah okay <laughs> um so that that's a discipline for me and I guess when I'm the, the, I think what you're asking is how do I stay on message? How do I, how do I visually stay on message when I'm working on something? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, one that depends on the story, right? Like the, some stories are easier to do that than others. I specifically with the Aboriginal Australian communities, my focus there was that who, of this population, what are, what are the pockets of this population who have actively reconnected with their land? Uh, Because 
so much of the Aboriginal Australian story right now is about being urbanized and loss of connection and, you know, horrible health numbers and, and disconnect from the education system there and the, um, just really, really hard stuff, very similar to our, the story with Native Americans here. It's just a, there, there's a, a disconnect with the society that they're surrounded by. And, and then also a horrible history of what's happened to them, that the, a legacy that they, of trauma, basically, that they're dealing with. So it's a very big story. And what I, and I set out to look at I did set out with a really broad net and then I decided, you know what, I just want to focus on these groups and families, these communities that have gotten to a place where they've just, they, they see the value in reconnecting with their ancestral land. They have access to it, which was very privileged for them because a lot of Aboriginal Australians don't have access to that and celebrate their connectiveness to it. So it actually ended up from a very complex story for me visually, it, it turned very simple in that I just wanted to celebrate them connecting with their land. And and at the same time, if I, if I saw that contrast of, of why it was so needed, I, I wanted to portray that as well. But the ultimate story was about that celebration of their connectedness to the land. I think this happens with with stories, sometimes I think people can get so caught up visually as, as photographers, if you're trying to do this kind of heady story, it can really stop you up, I think, where you're mm-hmm. you like you it might send you on a path of point pictures. And I think that for me, what keeps me on the more visual language track is to allow more conceptual themes to guide me like with the widow's project love was a huge word that i just kept coming into my brain and beauty and strength and grief was part of it as well um I don't know what the right word for it is, but it's something about disconnected, like being being shunned out of society in a way. Yeah. But then with that, you have to show that resilience too. So that keeps me on track. So if I know I'm in the right place, like with the Aboriginal story, okay, I'm on this ancestral land with this family that they have decided that this is this is what they're going to invest their, their future to. They're going to invest time here so that their kids remain connected. They're going to pass down stories. They're going to cherish this space. As long as I'm there, then anything within that is what matters. And then I'm like, I just want to photograph beauty. Mm. <laughs> you know, like I don't know. Like I, it's it's kind of this conversation with myself, but I think it's more about getting yourself to the right place, and then and then having your themes in order of what you're looking for. Uh, your husband is a photojournalist as well, and you work in collaboration with him on sometimes yeah uh, projects. And I I would assume that you guys are can be very different in terms of your approach and and your styles and your sensibilities when you guys are working together. How do you guys complement each other? You know, I think what we best complement each other when we are assisting the other one in their story. (laughs) (laughs) How's that for it? That says a lot right there. Yeah. (laughs) Very diplomatic. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But true, actually, uh, I think that we, we shine like our, our relationship shines when we are one of us is helping the other person with a project. It's, it's actually quite amazing and wonderful. The, the domestic life has been more of a challenge for us. Like we get, it's, it's not quite as, quite as shiny. We're getting better at it, (laughs) but um, definitely there, there's just been some great projects where we're, the because we know how to support the other person really well and there's a sense of relief to it too you're like uh oh, this is his project i know exactly what he needs for it but it's not on me if it doesn't work out because <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yeah. i know at one point you got before you you had your your child you guys were doing your respective jobs and you guys would be could be in different parts of the country or different parts of the world um yeah 
It's which, yeah. you know, it's a challenge enough when, you know, one person is sort of left at home, but it also when you have someone else that even if you get home, they may not be there and that yeah. could be a real challenge. Yeah. Yeah, totally. For sure. Yeah. And we're reinventing that now as parents, I think we're, we're recalibrating, you know, all of it, everything, which is interesting to do. You know, it's, it's kind of, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you think of your photographic creative life in those chapters where something pushes you and shifts you and you kind of have to like, recalibrate for yeah. lack of a better word but those are good periods too they're not always easy but they're good you know do you find that this time uh, as you're transitioning transitioning to uh, playing a role as as a teacher that it provides you an opportunity to see to look at your your work in a different way than you were when you were constantly hustling not to say that you're not hustling now, but there's a certain degree that you can sort of step back because you're using your, uh, you have to put on a different hat, basically. Yeah. Um, how does it allow you to sort of revisit your work? You know, ask me in a year and I'll probably be more eloquent about it. But I, I think what I'm discovering right now is a, one, I've never taken this much time to look at the work of others. Hmm. And I just have never had that time and it wasn't something you know like I, I didn't I did go to grad school for for photography but it was really mostly about just getting out there and, and taking images but I've, I've never like taken the time to like analyze other work and really think through it to the to the level I mean I've done that with my own work because I've had to edit so much and work with editors and stuff like that and think through stories and just as needed basis. But right now it feels like I'm getting, it's, it's been really interesting to like slow down and, and think through other bodies of work and why it works and why it doesn't and have to articulate that. And so that's been, that's been amazing. I don't know. I maybe I'm, I hope for some time in the future to be able to kind of relook at my archive. I think it would be interesting right now. I'm more interested in and, and craving to find a way to keep creating work in the context of how demanding the job is. And, and it, it might, I think it's going to shift and impact how I work and, and the type of projects that I start digging into. And I'm, I'm welcoming that. I think that could be really interesting to have to change how I'm, approaching things even if it's logistically having to change yeah. that changes how you see things and i'm welcoming that right now well my last question that i ask each guest is i ask them to recommend a photographer and it can be anyone someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered so who would that one photographer be and why oh to look at hmm. i find the work of uh Jason Eskanowski really interesting. Do you know his work? I don't think so. I find, I mean, his, I love his, I love his frames. I, they're just powerful. And these, he did an amazing book called Wonderland. And it was the study of the fall, basically, of the Soviet Union. And, but it's just everyday life pictures. It's very like. Oh, weird. yes. Yes. I know. I know his work. Yeah interesting but 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 like so his work is just incredible but then there's i i also really am always interested in his sort of how he survived as a photographer like he ended up being uh i think on the security for the moma and and i hope i'm not getting all this wrong but he was like a night watchman for um moma <laughs> And oh, okay. so, so he decided to like surround himself with, with art uh, and then he would go work on this project. But I think part of that from my impression was that he didn't want to just be getting these assignments and have that drive how he worked. Mm -hmm. uh, he kept it his own sacred thing, personal project stuff. So I find that interesting. You know, I, I think it's interesting how, <clears throat> excuse me. I find it interesting how um, you we have to watch ourselves or we have to take care of ourselves as 
image makers and creators and our creative voice, we have to nurture it and protect it and take care of it in the context of getting assignments like that, because there's so many outer voices and demands with Mm -hmm. assignments like that. And you wake up one day and you're like, where am I? (laughs) Where did I go? You know? And so I think, and, and that's kind of an exciting thing for the world I'm entering now. Like I don't have to rely on assignment work to, to survive. It's all can be from me really. And what my, what the impacts I choose to have around it. And so I think in the spirit of that, I think uh, I've, I, I like looking at his work and knowing that it was such a personal endeavor for him to, uh, to create that body of work. Well, thank you for that recommendation. And thank you for your, for your time. I really enjoyed it. You, thank you for your awesome questions. It was great. Thanks to Amy for joining us. Find out more about her and her work by visiting amytunzing.com. My next online workshop is scheduled to begin at the end of the month. It's titled, Using Your Life to Jumpstart Your Photography. If you've been struggling, trying to find ways to sustain your creativity during the pandemic, this course may be just the solution. It allows you to use the current circumstances of your life, just as it is, to create a strong body of work. It's meant to provide you wonderful breakthroughs and the beginnings of a body of work that you can be proud of. There are a few slots available, and I hope you'll join us. Find out more by visiting nobechicreative.com or visit the links in the show notes or the website. If you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the show, write us a review on whatever service you listen to podcast. Those reviews have allowed us to grow. Thanks to Mass625, from the U.S. and Dominique from Montreal, Canada for their five-star reviews. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and our mailing list. On the YouTube channel, I offer critiques on images submitted by TCF listeners like you, while the mailing list keeps you updated with all TCF events, including workshops and more. Sign up today. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or make a one-time or reoccurring donation via PayPal. Thanks to Ron Sparrow, Stephen Brink, Dominique Perron, Dan Plummer, and Philip Swalinas for their recent contributions. We also provide a series of ebooks on photography available for purchase on our website. It's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge and another way for you to support the show. And if you find you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you listen to podcasts, download the Candor Frame app, which is available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frames audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.